Hello, my name is David Haas, and as you can see from the title, the uh, subject is going to be cryocooling protein crystals and other macromolecular crystals. Uh, but the reason that crystals are cryocooled is so that they reduce radiation damage during synchrotron X-ray uh, detection. Uh, I did this work on cryocooling the very first protein crystal back in 1967. And then I left science uh, in 1970 and di discovered that, in fact, it was being used until just a few years ago. It, it turns out that the message that I'm going to deliver today is, in fact, that uh, research that you publish, your scientific research, in peer-reviewed journals will, in fact, uh, could possibly be used years and years ahead uh, when you can't even foresee what would happen, and that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, the article I published in 1970 um, was read and has been used uh, very successfully today uh, by thousands of scientists around the world um, uh, in all types of synchrotron radiation. So I'm going to tell you the story. And in fact, this is a picture taken of me when I worked in crystallography for five years between 1965 and 1970. And then I joined industry. So this is when I was a graduate student collecting data at the University of Buffalo. In 1965, I went on a, my first postdoc, and it was with David Phillips uh, at the Royal Institution in London. And in fact, uh, you can see here the lysosome molecule. He had just solved the structure in 1965. Uh, and when I arrived, he had suggested uh, a project for me uh, and that I look at trying to reduce radiation damage in protein crystals. So I worked on that for a year and a half at the Royal Institution. Uh, with David Phillips. And of course, at that time, Sir Lawrence Bragg was actually the director. So he was very interested in the subject also. A um, year and a half, had no results whatsoever. And then uh, I left the Royal Institution and went to the Weissman Institute soon after that. And I'll tell you that story later on. But the important fact is that three-dimensional structures of protein crystals have become very important. And it's actually created an entire new field called structural biology. In 1971, the Protein Data Bank was begun. And uh, this is a picture of the various proteins. There were nine protein structures solved in 1973. The Protein Data Bank has basically become the, the heart of molecular biology. It is the, the resource where all the structures of uh, macromolecules are, are saved. And today, there are more than 150,000 structures that have been deposited. Uh, and, um, both of proteins, nucleic acids, DNA, and a number of other macromolecules. Uh, one of the most remarkable things is that uh, each year now, about 10,000 new structures are being deposited. That's about 50 a day. Uh, and uh, the data is being collected, the crystal data uh, for x-rays is being collected on synchrotrons. So I only discovered this uh, just a few years ago. And uh, when I went to my scientific meeting, in, 19, in 2015, I was given a copy of, of this magazine, which is a special issue of Journal of Molecular Biology, 50 Years of Protein Structure. And uh, Max Perutz and, of course, John Kendrew uh, were the two scientists who determined the very two first protein structures. But today, uh, it is 60 years, 2019, since the first protein structures were solved. And uh, it's been 52 years since the first cryocooling of protein crystal. Uh, the protein data bank has increased in the number of, uh, of uh, structures uh, dramatically. And what is surprising is that about 90% of all these structures in the protein data bank have been cryocooled, meaning that the data was collected at about 100 degrees Kelvin. From the uh, Journal of Molecular Biology issue, there was a paragraph that said the three most significant things uh, for the creation of structural biology field is, in fact, uh, the invention of the synchrotron, uh, cryocooling of crystals, which permit them to be used, and, uh, of course, the high-speed computers and the remarkable uh, computer programs and software that have been developed to solve the structures. And just to amplify on that a little bit, uh, this is the synchrotron at Brookhaven National Laboratory. There are 50 synchrotrons similar to this around the world, and they are available to all scientists. A synchrotron produces X-rays about 10 million times more intense 
than the vacuum tubes that I use. I mean, 10 million times, just remarkable. You can collect the data on a single crystal in a matter of minutes, whereas in, in the 1960s, it would take months or years to collect the data. Uh, and of course, the synchrotrons, now that they provide such an intense X-ray source, uh, the crystals are protected by cryocooling and simply uh, putting the crystals into liquid nitrogen. And that's exactly the way it was done in 1967 uh, that I'm going to tell you about. And the third thing, of course, is the magnificent uh, computer uh, software and hardware that is available today that permits the three-dimensional structures not only to be solved, but also the graphic interfaces that permit you to visualize them. But there is also a fourth uh, area, and that is, in fact, the cloning to be able to produce proteins, uh, the purification of proteins, and a third area, which is the crystallization of proteins, which have become an entire field in itself. Just the ability to be able to crystallize uh, these enormous macromolecules. So this really is a back to the future story. Um, this is a story that happened to me, and that's what I want to relate to you uh, as, as young scientists or graduate students. Basically, you should realize that once you publish your scientific results in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, it could be used any time in the future. And this back to the future story that I'm telling you is, is exactly what happened to me. Fifty years later, uh, I discovered that the work that I did, which I had totally forgotten about, uh, I discovered was very valuable. So in 1970, uh, Michael Rossman and I published a paper, uh, the second paper on cryocooling. And uh, the purpose, and it was taken on lactic dehydrogenase crystals, cryocooled, and we showed that, in fact, the uh, radiation damage at room temperature is much more severe than it is at cryocooled. In fact, uh, we showed that there's a, an improvement of 10 times the life of the crystal uh, at low temperatures. Today, at synchrotrons, typically they consider the uh, crystals to have 70 times or more the lifetime in the X-ray beam. So this is the first quantitative proof, uh, and it came out of this 1970 paper. So let me just review with you um, basically my five years in crystallography and basic science. Um, after graduating from uh, University of Buffalo with David Harker, um, we arranged for a postdoc at the Royal Institution of Great Britain. David Phillips had just finished uh, working on lysozyme structure. And in fact, uh, Sorens Bragg was the director. Um, after working a year and a half on not having any results whatsoever on reducing the radiation damage, um, I went to the Weizmann Institute because he, David Phillips, had taken a position in Oxford. And upon arriving at the Weizmann, I decided I had already brought all my supplies with me, and I continued to work on the um, radiation damage problem project for about three more months. Um, in March of 1967, I decided that it was absolutely hopeless. I needed to find some other alternative. And what I did, in fact, was um, made a list of all the alternatives that I could think of. And I chatted with Wilfried Traub, who was the director uh, of the crystallography lab. And I concluded that crowd cooling looked like the most promising. And as fate would have it, uh, Wilfried Traub had just built a crowd cooling apparatus uh, about five years before, and it was sitting in the laboratory unused. So, um, and not only that, he uh, said I could use it, as well as the technician who is currently in the lab is the one who built it, and he would teach me how to use it. So I was able to cryocool isozyme crystals with, with uh, cryoprotectants. Uh, they gave pristine diffraction patterns like this one. And then, in fact, after leaving in the beam day after day after day, uh, there was no change. And this was the first indication that I had that, in fact, there was a, some protection uh, or there was real radiation reduction in this uh, lysozyme crystal. So this paper was published um, from the Weizmann. And then uh, uh, the Six-Day War occurred in June of 1967. I had already arranged with Michael Rossman at Purdue University to uh, go there. And I arrived in late 1967 at Purdue. Um, my project that I wanted to work on with Michael was 
to show quantitatively that, in fact, radiation reduction uh, is, is uh, performed. And uh, I was able to convince Michael uh, by showing him those wonderful precession pictures from the Weissman uh, that, in fact, uh, um, I could do the project. So he loaned me his diffractometer, and I built this equipment at the Purdue in 1967, and we collected all the data uh, and during the summer of 1968. Uh, after that, we wrote the paper, and this was, uh, was published uh, in, uh, in April of 1969. It's the Haas and paper. Uh, we submitted it in July of 68. <clears throat> and basically, the most important part of that paper uh, was, in fact, this drawing of the radiation decay, which clearly shows a tenfold improvement in radiation reduction damage uh, in a cryocooled state. Uh, soon after that, I had given a number of papers on this result and uh, the cryocooling of protein crystals at a number of scientific meetings. And basically, at each of the meetings, uh, there were no questions, and uh, a number of people said it's nice work, but it has absolutely no application. So, um, besides having a, a little depression from that, I also decided I, I really wasn't fit for academia, and I joined industry. So, from 1970 through basically 2015, I was out of the academic world. <clears throat> In um, 2015, as I said, as I went to my American Crystallographic Association meeting, um, uh, and I started learning about uh, structural biology, I was invited to attend the X-ray methods course at Cold Springs Harvard Laboratory. Uh, and that was 2017. Uh, 16 days of intense uh, study, uh, but the most remarkable part was that the first week, um, we grew lysozyme crystals, uh, we cryocooled them, and then we sent them to uh, the Brookhaven synchrotron and collected all the data uh, in a matter of minutes. Uh, I can tell you one of my surprises was walking into the hutch, the X-ray hutch at the synchrotron, which is what this photograph is. Um, basically, the instrumentation looked so fantastic, and I didn't recognize any of it except for the door, uh, the liquid nitrogen door, which basically was the same door that James Dewar had invented back in 1892. So um, I didn't feel so bad about that. Uh, one of the remarkable a coincidence is that um, uh, in 1892, James Dewar did his work in exactly the, at the Royal Institution, but it was also in exactly the same laboratory that I did my X-ray work when I was there in 1965. And I'm sure James Dewar would be very impressed about how his invention is being used today. So the results of structural biology and the protein data bank basically produced an entire foundation for molecular biology. And I'm sure uh, many of you who are in the biological sciences have come to appreciate the value of having these remarkable three-dimensional structures and data available. So in my second presentation, uh, I'm going to tell you about how my postdoctoral work, 50 years later, has contributed substantially uh, to structure-based drug design which has led to um, many of the drugs that have been used uh, for the HIV epidemic. And as I will specifically show you, the Lazarus effect, which is one of, one of the phenomena uh, that happened in 1996 uh, during the HIV epidemic. I'd also like to thank the people who helped me over the years. Um, as you might gather, David Phillips, uh, who suggested the original project of um, reduced radiation damage, uh, Wolfie Traub. If he had not had in his laboratory the cryocooling equipment that I used, it probably never would have gotten done, probably 10, 20, 30 years later. Uh, Michael Rossman, I think, who recognized the importance of uh, having a single crystal that showed reduced radiation damage so you could collect all your data. And then I especially want to thank Elspeth Garman, uh, who is one of the uh, experts in radiation damage and has taught me in a matter of months uh, what I did not learn in 50 years. So 
The final sentence should be science for the benefit of humanity, which is exactly what I see structural biology has contributed. Thank you.